This episode is sponsored by Cameo Media, bringing custom video and audio content to Adams County, Pennsylvania, and the world. Kyle Meyer and Amy Gibson are the minds and cameras behind Cameo Media, and they've been friends of mine ever since we were neighbors when I lived off campus above the Ragged Edge coffee shop my senior year at Gettysburg College. Kyle and Amy are two of the most creative people I know, and we were able to put together some really great video content in association with this podcast. So head on over to the Modern Bar Cart social media channels and check that out. You can learn more about Kyle and Amy's work by visiting cameomedia.com or by emailing cameomedia at gmail.com. And now, on to the episode. Modern. 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 We're prepping for a voyage. Modern. The force of an old-fashioned equals whiskey mass times bitters acceleration. Why don't you make that a double? Modern Bar Cart. What's shaking, cocktail fans? Welcome back to another episode of the Modern Bar Cart Podcast. I'm your host, Modern Bar Cart CEO, Eric Koslick. Thanks for joining me for another fantastic interview episode where we pull up a seat with the people who are making excellent spirits and cocktails in a town or city near you. I love these conversations because each one teaches you a little more about what trends are emerging in the industry, and if I had to pick one word to summarize this particular interview, it would be local. This episode, we hang out with distiller Yanni Barakas of Mason Dixon Distillery in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, home, of course, to the Gettysburg National Military Park, as well as to my alma mater, Gettysburg College. We talk a lot about what it means to look at spirits through a local lens as you take them from grain to glass. But before we launch in, I think it's only fair that we give you the chance to make yourself a drink. This episode's featured cocktail is the corn and oil, made using two different types of rum and built in a Collins glass. This sweet, complex sipper is perfect for port sitting as the weather warms up. There are a number of different recipes floating around out there, but I'm going to offer you the one I think best lends itself to a beautiful presentation of the drink. To make it, you'll need one ounce of aged rum, one ounce of blackstrap rum, Myers rum or Cruzon blackstrap are popular options here, three quarters of an ounce of lime juice, one ounce of velvet falernum, which is a spiced syrup used in many popular tiki drinks, and several dashes of aromatic bitters. We, of course, like to use our embitterment aromatic bitters. Combine everything except for the blackstrap rum in a cocktail shaker with ice, shake it up vigorously, and then strain into a Collins glass over crushed or pebble ice. Then pour the blackstrap rum over the top for a nice dark float and garnish with a lime wedge. The result is a cocktail that's golden brown on the bottom and dark like an oil slick on top. And this separation occurs because the blackstrap rum has a higher overall proof than the rest of the drink, which causes it to float rather than to integrate smoothly with all the other ingredients. Of course, as you sip, the blackstrap rum will mix with everything else, which creates a dynamic and three-dimensional drinking experience for you and your guests that is sure to please. We sample a couple different rums in this episode, so if you're able to get your hands on them, maybe the corn and oil should be the first drink you try. Getting back to the interview, some of the things that Yanni and I discuss include how a napkin sketch, a home distilling fire, and a serious accident led Yanni to pursue a career in distilling sooner than he anticipated. What Mason Dixon Distillery is doing to introduce folks in central Pennsylvania to incredible craft spirits and a wide variety of bold flavors in their German beer hall inspired pub. How Yanni managed to get a grant to farm his grain on the Gettysburg National Military Park. A curated tasting of Mason Dixon's excellent craft spirits and some notes on the distilling setup and barrel program used to create them. The difference between a hyper-specialized spirits program and a more wide-ranging approach to building your portfolio, and much, much more. 
Toward the end of this interview, Yanni tells an incredible story about a miraculous moment that took place on the battlefield early on in Mason Dixon Distillery's development. It's one of the rawest and most powerful clips we've captured on this podcast, and there were tears in his eyes as he told it, and in mine as I listened and tried to imagine myself into that moment. I won't spoil it for you, but if you're a longtime listener of the podcast, I think you've got that little flutter of excitement right now because you know that you're in for a real treat. And with that, I hope you enjoy this candid, passionate conversation with Yanni Barakas of Mason Dixon Distillery. Yanni, thanks for being on the podcast. Pleasure. Can't wait to do this thing. So can you just introduce yourself for our listeners? Tell us a little bit about you and how you came to be in charge of this fine distillery? Sure. Well, I guess the slightly abbreviated version is still going to get a little long, but uh, the way it goes is I uh, built my first still when I was 11 years old. I was asking my grandfather about growing up. I'm second generation born here. He was born and lived the beginning of his life in a remote mountain village in Greece. So they made moonshine. Had a series of questions developed. He sketched something out, answered some questions. As an adventurous 11 year old, I went home and started moonshining. Ran it for a couple of weeks in my parents' garage until they found out about it. And the way they found out about it was I almost burnt the house down. Uh, saved the house from being burnt down, but uh, that was kind of my first potential fork in the roads. Uh, my father was alerted to what I was doing. He came home, woke me up. I expected a very unpleasant conversation. Instead, what I got was an early morning trip to Walmart. He got me an electric hot plate, told me to keep it outside. Uh, had that, and yeah, right. So the reason I view that as a first fork in the road is had my father laid down the law and said, you don't do this anymore, probably wouldn't be here today. Fast forward a whole bunch, post-college, had a career, a very fledgling career, but just started. And um, I got in a car accident and it laid me up real bad. It uh, effectively put me in bed for two years and I was in the middle of that told to go on disability that I never work again. Uh, that, that tore me up pretty bad, and I uh, decided to make one final push. Finally, found some doctors that were able to point me in a direction, help me get better, but also warned that I would never be whole. So always wanted to open up a distillery, thought I'd do it later in life, work in retirement, and I figured I'd just fast forward the plan to now. It gives me flexibility to work around some injuries and some physical limitations, and uh, it's also something I really, really enjoy doing. So. Arrived in Gettysburg, uh, came to Gettysburg because uh, I found out about some agricultural leases on the military park. And I thought, how cool would that be if we could grow our grain on Gettysburg National Military Park, put National Park in a bottle for people to take home with them. Yeah. So applied for the lease, got the phone call that said, what you're doing is pretty cool, but you're not a farmer. No. Kept the guy on the phone for an hour, turned the no into a yes, started farming, and then had to scramble to find a place and found this place. Took about a year and a half to bring it to life. That was... Uh, a year and a half of jumping through hoops of the local government, the state government, the federal government, meticulously restoring 10,000 square feet of 100-year-old factory. And um, one of the most challenging things probably was to just secure financing. I went to over 30 banks until I got somebody to say yes. But at that point in time, I had gone so far what I felt on my own in physically rehabbing myself that I didn't think that there was going to be a single person that could stand in my way and stop me from doing what I wanted to do. Yeah, that's that's a really intense story. And it, it's funny how the physical pain of rehabilitating your body kind of mirrors some of that like procedural and administrative pain that any craft distiller will just tell you about just that first year or two of trying to even start the distillery before you open the doors. It is just painful. It's running through walls. It's it, it is definitely running through walls. I tell people that uh, my secret weapon was something I was always was told was a uh, not a skill set. It in fact would be something to my detriment, but just stubbornness. Just put your head down and and move forward. Refuse to not move forward. It's one foot in front of the other. Some days, some days it's it's strides, but yeah. From the the it's a it's a very bureaucratic process in some sense. So then going to the banks was a very salesmanship project. So you, 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 you got to dig deep and, and pull everything you got to make it happen. It's definitely not an easy thing. There's a highly regulated industry from top to bottom. Yes, especially in a control state, which Pennsylvania is. Correct. Pennsylvania actually grants us craft distillers some, some pretty cool liberties. Uh, the fact that we're allowed to 
make our own liquor, and then we can turn around and sell it not only by the bottle, but by the glass uh, that we're allowed to have food alongside of it. That's where the whole restaurant being with the distillery came from. In fact, Pennsylvania allows us to self-distribute, not something we widely do as of right now, but something we're going to start to dip our toe into this year. For sure, for sure. Well, I want to definitely later on in this chat talk a little bit about local, what that means, what it means for Pennsylvania, what it means for Adams County, and, and especially the like the way that you're sourcing your ingredients. But my one follow-up question from, from your introduction has to do with completely non-local. It has to do with, with your, your grandfather from Greece. And so he was sort of the inspiration that got you going in this, you sketched out some, some still blueprints on a napkin. What is moonshine in Greece? And the, like, can you describe that for folks? Oh, sure can. So moonshine in Greece is called Cipodo. It is typically distilled from the leftover pressings from grapes that were used to make wine. Okay. Cipodo can be explained. Uh, that's something that more people would be familiar with. It is the the cousin of Italian grappa. It's really pretty much the same thing. So if you've had grappa before, you know it's got some real strong flavors and it's probably not a beginner's spirit. The other, so Tsipuro, yeah, is is phenomenal. We, by the end of this year, we're actually gonna make some, make a batch, kind of pay homage to my roots and how I got into this. And something that's gonna happen before that is we're actually have some ouzo, which I probably should have brought some out to taste and we'll probably should go back and get some to taste. Sure. Uh, found a recipe that I made when I was a kid and scaled it up. Ouzo is another spirit that Greece is naturally known for. Big anise, and lots of black licorice notes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's one of those that's typically drunk uh, over ice or ice cold water and it luches. It's got that really nice um, sort of, it's in the absinthe family where there's all these oils and aromatic compounds. And when you, you add a little bit of chill and a little bit of, of water, it just, it's beautiful. And especially if you think about, imagine yourself sipping it in this hot Mediterranean climate in the middle of the day and right under an umbrella. Oh, there's, it's not a flavor for everyone. It, it sometimes it turns people off because the black licorice, but man, even if you're not into it super hard, situationally, there are a few things that are more refreshing. Uh, I, I agree completely. Uh, sometimes I prefer it straight, sometimes over ice. The, that milky cloudiness that comes has a very strong visual appeal to it. We'll turn it into a couple different very spring summery cocktails as well once we get it on the shelf. Nice, nice, very nice. And, and bringing up the Greek moonshine, the ouzo, and, and seeing the, the various colors in the glasses in front of us that we'll, that we'll taste through in a moment here, it kind of brings to my attention the fact that, that you're doing a, a specific approach to a distillery. Some people, when they open distilleries, like Sagamore Spirit, for example, in, in Baltimore, they are a rye distillery. They focus on rye. They've got this rye, that rye, and the other rye, but it's rye. And it seems to me that you're taking a very different approach. So I guess my, my main question is, you know, what makes Mason Dixon Distillery special? And, and what made you decide to take this kind of diverse approach to spirits as opposed to a more, you know, streamlined or specialized approach? So on the simplest level, so I don't get bored, so it doesn't become factory work. This is artisan, this is craft, this is, I get to play around. Try this, try that, see what I like, see what I love, see what I don't like, and and it keeps it fresh for me and what we're doing. And on the flip side, having a restaurant attached to the distillery, where's the basis of the customer experience here, it gives you quite an array of options. So there's there's going to be something here for a lot of people, not something for everyone. We have uh, boldness in all of our spirits is something I have. So that occasionally will turn somebody away. But uh, we, I, I think what we make is connoisseur for us. You'll find new flavors in, in categories of spirits that maybe you didn't know were there before. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think having that paired with a restaurant or pub style situation allows people like kind of like that comfort right there's the 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 food is the comfort the food is the thing of like oh man like i I want a really good burger let's head over to mason dixon and still grab that oh that that there's a new spirit on the board bartender what's up with this new release and it's kind of like an entryway it's kind of scaffolding people into something that they might not have otherwise been uh, eager to try correct and uh, i think you use two different things there comfort the the food menu 
we see it as comfort food with our own twist on it. It's almost exclusively not South Central Pennsylvania comfort food. So yes, you can get a burger, it's amazing, it's all local beef, but you can also come in this week and try our specials, which are constantly evolving. So we have some ribs, some smoked ribs on the menu. We have some Korean pork tacos, shrimp po' boy coming from down south. So it is comfort. And then that uh, that new experience, yes, there's always there's always something new. And, and sometimes it's an easy parallel of, hey, if you really like this spirit we make, maybe you should try this but also it just comes back to constant evolution, constant trying things out, making, making new things and, and pushing people's personal boundaries to try some new things and maybe discover that there's other things out there that they like other than those one or two staples that they've always had. Yeah, totally. One of the things that I notice when you venture outside of the major metropolitan areas, and, and I would classify Adams County here, you know, you hear the train in the background. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, it, this is outside of, of most major metropolitan areas, although it's, it's really convenient from Baltimore or or DC. One of the things that I find is that folks out in these parts are are not as adventurous as a whole. Like on, if you took the average, it wouldn't be as adventurous of a palette uh, that you that you would find maybe in in DC, for example. And what I see with your approach that's so attractive to me is that you're giving them like the constant. The K in this equation is the the space and the food and the consistency like consistently good experiences and if you can offer that then they're going to trust you more to to guide them along so i think of like let's let's say you had some guests visiting from out of town right and and they're only going to be in town for like one or two nights and you're like all right you got to come here and have this right you got to come and have this particular plate in your case it's not you got to come here and have this it's you got to come here because no matter what you have, it's going to be interesting and you, you've got a bit of trust. Is that like an accurate way of like gauging that opening up of, of the palette? From, from start to finish, yes. Like we're definitely Adams County conservative area. I was also raised most of my life in Lancaster County, so also uber conservative area. Yeah, very dutchy. Um, like the, the, the palette there is yeah. kind of flat. Muted. It's yeah. like buttered noodles with maybe a little salt and pepper, and that is not what we do here. We keep some safer dishes, which are still incredibly well executed and have tons of flavor. But then, yeah, we ask every now and then to, to, to try things with us. Um, most recently, the try things with us was we put frog legs on the menu as an appetizer. Whoa, where'd it you was, source those from? U.S. Foods. Uh, we we have a huge emphasis on local, but there are some stuff that just isn't going to happen. <laughs> right, um, right. So U.S. Foods is a provider we use. They have a lot of... Um, they do a lot of great things. They have a lot of value-added services that help you dive in and help tweak your business and, and become efficient and operate on a higher level. And typically when we need something that's not readily available, we're going to go to them. But Frog Legs, we brought them in and the attitude from myself was we will either sell out of them or I'm just eating frog legs for a long time. There you go. And we sold out of them. So, you know, our locals, our regular consistent customer base, trust us enough to try when we throw that left field thing out there. Our out-of-towners, when they find us, might have a more uh, adventurous palate and want to dive right in. They want to they leave the meat and potatoes alone and they want to go into the left field right away, which is great. But that also speaks to the evolution that we had when we started. When we first started, we were small plates tapas because that's the way I like to eat. Try a little bit of everything, big, bold flavors everywhere. Quickly found out that tapas and small plates were not for Adams County. So we developed entrees and switched over our entire order taking system and how our tickets were fired and started coursing our meals. So. Yeah, it's it's yeah. You're 100 percent correct. A little more conservative area, a little more meat and potatoes, but uh, we we have that and we execute it well. But we also bring in some other more boundary pushing things. Very very cool. So before we get to tasting these spirits, uh, I, I wanted to just hear you talk a little bit about your stills and your distillation method and a little bit about um, how you source the ingredients for this stuff because it, it's a really good way to get a, a bit of a read on an individual craft distiller by you know like examining their equipment and their process so could you talk a little bit about that sure let's split it up into two parts I so don't forget the second half of the question let's start mat raw materials and then we'll jump into stills um, raw materials we locally source as much as we can when we can. And what that actually means to you and to our customers is 100% of our raw grains are coming within five miles of here. Most of them are coming off of Gettysburg National Military Park that we farm ourselves. 
our malted grains are coming from a small craft malt shop just our side of Philadelphia, but most of the barley that they malt is actually coming from just above Harrisburg, so even closer. The only raw ingredient we import, aside from spices for spiced rum and gin, the only raw ingredient we import is our molasses to make our rum. And rum legally has to be made from sugarcane, sugarcane not grown anywhere near where we live. So it's always, in order to legally make rum, going to have to be an imported ingredient. Right, right. So stepping into the stills, uh, my stills uh, my <laughs> are, I, I love them now. I hated them at first. My, my main still almost sank my business before we ever opened. It was direct fire unit, purchased it brand new from a producer overseas, and uh, I was sold a bill of goods. And when it arrived, it worked for a little bit, and then it stopped working. And his response was, well, too bad, so sad. So uh, I had to entirely re-engineer how the stills work. So instead of being direct fired, they're now steam direct steam injections made at the time a lot of modifications to the column we built a deflagmator up top which is a, a condenser up top which helps gives us more control over the proof and then eventually what we stepped into is we actually got and that still originally had packing in the column so now we actually have a still with trays and a big professional dis, um, deflagmator on top I have a great degree of control but the most basic level it's a, it's a, a hybrid still so it's a pot with a column on top we can uh, a lot of times I end up not really using the deflamator. So all my spirits are run through that still at least twice. So adding with that those trays in there, the amount of times it's redistilled is, is actually quite a bit more than just twice. But we'll do a stripping run where we capture everything. And then what we'll do is we'll fill up a tote and we'll put that tote back into the still. And that's where we actually make our cuts. I found it produces something, it produces spirits that are able to be clean and still have a lot of character at the same time whereas at first when we had started we tried to just do one and really work the deflamator back and forth and and it uh you got the big flavor but there was not, just not quite the level of smoothness we're able to achieve with this now okay yeah it's interesting how you tweak your process there and i have a couple quick follow-up questions for listeners so are trays in the column still the same as like a plate it's going to be a plate and, and it has it has bubble caps on it so this is a uh it is the best technology one can have for distilling. It is a scaled down version of what you'll find in all commercial distill, all big commercial distilleries. Right. And those plates are what the alcohol vapors kind of condense on and then fall back. So it's, it's kind of, a, it's, it's like, that's what you were saying of like, it's actually distilled like a number of more times. And the, so, you know, the, as the vapor rises, these plates are kind of, you know, capturing it, re recondensing it slightly, and then it's going to re-evaporate and come back up. And, and that's, one of the big differences between column distillation and pot still distillation. And I, I love hybrid still technology because really what it does allow is for folks who want to take this varied approach to distillation like you, it allows them to get off the ground with one single unit as opposed to having to purchase two individual units. It's it's a really nice solution, I think. They're a multi-tool. Um, you can really, and, and honestly, if you run it fast enough, you can almost just bypass those trays altogether. So you're not getting any of that rectification, that redistilling you were talking about. So you can push some really character-rich spirits through, or you can really clean it up. It's how we're able to make a vodka that is phenomenal alongside a bourbon that is phenomenal alongside of a rum that's phenomenal. It really allows us to dial in how much rectification, how many more times distilled it is. I don't advertise how many times distilled it is because there is no... Uh, industry standard or regulated way and i've heard some stories about distilleries counting how many rivets are in their column and then they say well this is 197 times distilled because we have that many rivets and each rivet changes the uh the vapor path and therefore adds a little bit of reflux and that is our way of legitimizing how many times distilled it is uh, that's marketing mumbo jumbo i just stick with good clean flavorful spirits yeah, I like I like that. I, I do think that that's very marketing-y and, and just putting a number on something, the higher the number people assume, the better. That's just universally not true with spirits. Uh, there's a lot more going on. So the other question I did have was about direct fire versus like a steam jacketed still. Yes. Right. Can you just explain like at very at a very high level for folks because it's it's rather complicated. Could you just explain the difference and sort of like what the implications are? Sure. And actually, I'm going to throw a third one in there, which is going to be direct steam injection, which is what we do. Um, okay. Di direct fire, fire, a controlled fire underneath the still to provide heat. It is uh, most similar to how original distilleries would run because not you know natural gas, steam, electric weren't options. Also, kind of always had me a little uneasy, so I'm quite happy that we we changed that. Seeing as how we're distilling liquor, which is 
a flammable substance. Correct. Um, <laughs> st steam jacketed, it's going to be, so the jacket's going to be on the pot, which is the base, which is where you put your distiller's beer into or your distiller's wash into. It's actually a double walled container. So you actually pump your steam around the outsides in, in between, in the walls. So mm -hmm. you're, you're heating it up indirectly. Uh, it's, it tends to be a very gentle, even heat. Steam is just amazing to work with, period, regardless of how you use it. It's very controllable. It's, it doesn't want to scorch. What we're doing is actually direct steam injection. So we actually have a single walled pot and we have a steam line that drops right into the beer and it heats the beer. The steam enters enters the beer which is cooler than the steam and as the steam condenses into that liquid it actually deposits its heat slowly raising it's also a very friendly method for not scorching things and for mm -hmm. having a great degree of control and i don't need an expensive double walled pot which allowed me to actually save myself in the beginning when we had to re-engineer everything right steam injection is also uh you don't see it a lot of times you really don't see much of it on batch systems like we're doing but you steam injection is the way that continuous columns run so it's not foreign for distilling but it's it's probably a little foreign for craft distilling and small scale guys like ourselves right right well, it's cool that you were able to engineer that. And the way that I think about the difference between like a steam jacket still and direct steam injection is like, if you've ever had to like melt chocolate or temper chocolate, you do it in a double boiler. Yep. And that's essentially what a steam jacket is. It's like, you know, the, the heat is touching the outside of the vessel that holds the stuff that needs to get heated out as opposed to the direct flame touching that. And then with the direct steam injection, that's, is that just a one-way valve in like the middle or bottom of the pot? Uh, or is the steam coming in from above the beer? It's coming into, the, we pipe it into the bottom of mm -hmm. the beer and there is a valve. It's it, in this case, not a one-way valve, but it is a valve so we can control how much or how little. The best explanation would be almost if you took a tea kettle that was boiling and you hooked up a piece of pipe and then you stuck that piece of pipe into a pot of water. So all of the mm -hmm. steam is gonna travel through that pipe and go into the pot of water. Very good. So you're able to have that valve and control how much, how quickly, or how fast you want it to heat up. Even with uh, steam jacketed, there still can be some chances of scorching. You get some hot spots, especially if the mash isn't moving around. Um, steam injection's just not gonna scorch. Right, now I was gonna say, like that will probably circulate it a small amount to avoid that. Absolutely, it actually, it swirls it quite a bit. Okay. Um, so there's constant agitation in there, it's constantly going through. It will be of the same way. Uh, direct steam injection is probably relatively rare in craft distilling, but direct for for the actual act of distilling, direct steam injection for mash cooking is probably going to be a slightly more common thing to see. A lot of people will still mash cook in a jacketed vessel, but a lot more people actually steam inject to mash cook. It's just, it's faster. Yeah, interesting. Well, it sounds like you have a super interesting setup. Can we maybe start going through the some of the spirits that, that come out of that little beautiful contraption? I, I think we should. Yeah. <laughs> I think we should. So first one, I have a couple samples poured. So the first one is going to be our vodka. Distilled three times. So run through a big still twice, then we run it through a small still. That small still produces runs around 192, 193 throughout the duration of the run. Uh, legally, vodka has to be distilled over 190 proof the whole time. What makes my vodka probably most unique is that there is still some flavor in it. So we distill it three times and then we run it through an activated carbon filter that removes smell and taste. Now I stop it short. So you're still gonna get wheat sweetness and barley toastiness at room temperature you get a fair amount. If you're a vodka purist, you're gonna want this over ice. It's gonna knock that down a little bit. It's gonna take those same flavors, reduce them. And over ice, um, I think it becomes a real ode to the grain that it's made from. I was just gonna say, I mean, this has such an agricultural nose to it. And for a guy that loves his agriculture, that's not, that's not by accident. No, that's really, really nice. You get like, almost like a, not just not just a, a grain character like we would associate like picking up a handful of barley or a handful of you know wheat, but you almost get a bit of greenness to it, uh, and not like a raw greenness, but like a, a ripe greenness. I, I I can take that. It also just it comes across. It comes across very sweet, and probably the most interesting thing about that is zero additives, so no glycerin, no sugar, no citric acid. This is just liquor off the still with some highly filtered water. And what do you proof it down to? Uh, I typically shoot between 86 and 92, and I don't get mm -hmm. too particular between that unless there's a note that I really like at a certain proof. Uh, I don't take it below 86 because we don't chill filter and I don't want anything to get cloudy. And for whatever reason, science says 86 proof is the magic number. Right, yeah, so that's 
uh, so between 43 and like 47, depending Correct. on the run. So does that mean that when you're bottling this, you, you hand write that on the label? We hand write all the batches, we hand write who bottled it, we hand write the proof and the ABV by percent on every bottle. Our aged spirits, the, the bourbons, the whiskeys also have a handwritten spot for the age statements. That's really nice. You know, that's to me one of the, the values of, of going craft, right? Because you know when someone's actually physically writing it on there that there was some real attention to detail. It adds a tremendous amount of time and labor to the process. It would be easier to just say the vodka is always going to be 86 proof or 90 then, and then proof it down to that. But at, occasionally there's a note that I want to highlight. Uh, occasionally we turn out some overproof batches. I'm a big fan of overproof batches um, because I love to see the difference in taste. It's not just about the extra alcohol content. It's about what blossoms and blooms at certain proofs versus what curls up and hides. And most people don't think about that with vodka, right? No, they, not at all. You know, and it, it's very different culturally. And I think we are at a point where we're about, I think, to reach a, a tipping point in the craft world where vodka becomes explicitly more interesting and intentionally more interesting. There's already people doing it like Grey Wolf out of St. Michael's. RB has been on the podcast. He makes a really interesting single malt vodka. He has a very similar philosophy to yours, I think, where he's like, well, you know, what does neutral mean to you? We're, we, so when you do that, you're definitely, guys like us, we're definitely towing the line of being categorically correct. It's always interesting to see the consumer's reaction. I had a... Uh, enough people in the beginning of this with the vodka say, well, that doesn't taste like vodka. And I would <laughs> shake my head a little bit, weep inside, uh, outwardly stay very stoic and say, okay, um, got tired of it. So last year we actually submitted to two competitions and this vodka walked away with a gold medal from New York International. So that became my justification. Well, it might not be the vodka you're used to, um, but some people with some very talented palates think it's quite tasty. And I'm inclined to agree with that. So that's, <laughs> that's excellent. Man, I would love to play around with that. I feel like that, like, you know, th think about folks, think about the vodka cocktails that you would normally make, like a screwdriver or a Moscow mule or something. And, you know, what, what this really lends itself to is, is a little bit of personalization for you. Because then what you get to say is like, well, if I'm making a Moscow Mule, it's like, oh, well, I've got some really nice like agricultural notes in this vodka. Do I want the spiciest ginger beer I can find? Or do I maybe want something that allows a little bit more of that character through? And I don't know, maybe you're just a ginger fan. Maybe this is an opportunity to, to play, to change your script a little bit. And I think that's some value here. 100% yet, yes. And even just the most minor thing, like the temperature you serve it at, at room temperature, in certain ways, this is almost a whiskey drinker's vodka because whiskey drinkers like some notes of their grain. A single ice cube, serve this over ice cube, knock it down a couple degrees, and all of a sudden it becomes the vodka purest drink because it is super clean, but there's just that little bit of hint that dances around and keeps it from being boring and keeps it from being empty. And the last thing I wanted to create was, we've all had those vodkas where you taste them and you just generic rubbing alcohol is yep. the lasting impression and I refuse to put anything out like that. Right. Yeah. Something that needs to live in the freezer versus something that you could choose to put in the freezer or not. Correct. Next one up is a spirit that is not for everybody. This is corn whiskey. It is the only spirit that can legally bear the name whiskey despite never having been aged in a barrel. You can, you can age some in a barrel, but in this case, this is straight off the still. The only thing we add to its water, it is 95% corn, 5% malted barley. That malted barley never has a chance to come through because that corn is just so big and oily and delightful. This is a corn bomb. Start to finish, it's fresh ground corn. In a lot of ways, this is classic Americana because before mm -hmm. we figured out that aging stuff made it even better, your whiskey was clear regardless of what kind you had. Right. And you know what? I, I don't know if I agree with you on the barley not coming out because I think it comes out on the nose. Okay. I'll tell um, you. You know, because you definitely get like corn has that very unique sweetness to it. If you, if you, you bite into a, a really nice kernel of sweet corn and you get that pop of sweetness, it's very different from sugar sweetness or, you know, some other type of sweetness. And I get that, but I also get there's a little bit of darkness on the nose. And maybe that doesn't and come through on the palate. I, I, I think it comes through more on the nose the, than the actual tongue and mouth. Uh, and I would say within that, I think on the nose, it's more the first, like, initial impression before it goes into the corn. 
I love this spirit, but when I say it's not for everybody, we it, a lot of people never experienced clear whiskey before. Clear whiskey is supposed to be big, hot, angry, abrasive, mm -hmm. and I spend a lot of time with this to make it only a little bit hot and a little bit angry. <laughs> still sure. staying true to its roots, but still making it very, very palatable. And the big reason we made this in the beginning, the two big reasons is I love corn whiskey, and two, we wanted to make whiskey cocktails pretty early on. This is my only option as a clear spirit. I can have this ready in a couple of weeks, whereas aged spirits are months and years. Sure. And what happens with a lot of craft distillers is, you know, sometimes the new make spirit, the, the unaged whiskey ends up getting phased out of the collection down the line. Uh, I think, I think this is really nice. And I've actually taken to sipping more of the unaged whiskeys because it, to me, it's a, it's almost like a palate cleanser or a reminder. Like it's almost like I'm clearing my browser cache. Cause I'm like, okay, I've got all this stuff I, I know or associate with whiskey but let's, let's hit, you know, control A, delete, and then go back to the beginning and then work our way back up. And I feel like it gives me a more well-rounded understanding of, of what the flavors in the glass actually mean. I, I agree with that 100%, and I'd go even a step further. I think it's almost a, uh, a truth meter, a, a barometer of uh, how well the distiller performs. Because an aged spirit, your barrel is going to make up at least 50% of your flavor. A barrel can hide a lot of faults clear whiskey there is no hiding anything <laughs> that is very very true very true well that that's nice I, I really like that cocktails i would almost stick that in the boulevardier okay you know it's got got a little bit of that sweetness that is going to kind of marry with the campari and uh, the sweet vermouth but then it's it, it's got a bit of darkness to it like not aged darkness not like sweet wood darkness but it's got like got a little bit of that kind of you know that, that anger to it right mm -hmm. and the boulevardier to me is an angry drink it is uh if we're gonna if we're gonna personify the characteristics it is a uh it is a very capable it is very it is okay how do i want to say this um it knows what it's capable of but chooses to be a gentleman instead there you go there you go <laughs> i like that <laughs> Um, next one up is my white rum. This spirit kicked my butt. It took me three months to get it dialed in. Very first batch came out so close to what I wanted. And then uh, instead of just kind of going with my gut, I referenced books and I talked to experts. And every batch I made with those inputs, it got further and further away from what I wanted. And what I wanted was something that paid homage to Jamaican rum and South American rum. Something that's got some funk to it. 100% molasses based, no white sugar. I do not like spirits in general made from white sugar. There's always some harsh characteristics to it. I describe this as molasses and funk, and it, it, is, it is layered. It has a nice lingering finish, not, not at all unlike a whiskey's kind of tapered lingering finish. Makes great cocktails, but also sips amazingly well. Yeah, I really like the nose. It's, it's very um, <clears throat> vanilla caramel. Yeah. You know, it, it's got, like, it, it tells you right away, hi. Nice to meet you. I'm rum. I don't think from the just from the nose, I could tell you just molasses. Let me take a sip here. And I don't want it to just be molasses. I want. I, I, I do not want to produce anything that's one dimensional. I want layers. And you get on the palate, at least for me, you get that molasses character, especially towards the back of the palate and on the finish. Which, if you think of like taking a spoonful of molasses. That's kind of where the molasses sits on your palate is the back and the back and the, and the two sides of your tongue. I pull almost a little bit of toastiness as it sits as well, which is an interesting attribute, I think, in a, in a clear spirit. I get almost a little bit of, yeah, toastiness or like, um, yeah, to like, like a, almost like this is, this is a bad tasting note. And it's not a criticism by any means, but like a little soy sauce. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, but with, that's something. So that's something that you can pull out of rum sometimes, uh, especially the unaged ones uh, or the the ones that are hyper aged. Yeah, you, you're right. There's there's a little bit of, of toastiness to it, and that's interesting because this wasn't barrel aged. Not at all. There's no way it's completely clear. So this is fascinating. I think this would make some fun riffs on all your classic white rums cocktails. Your your da like a daiquiri with this. I would have a lot of fun with like dressing it up a bit yep. like i would have a lot of fun pairing this not just with the lime and the type of sugar like whether i'm using like a rich simple or a demerara simple but i'd also have some fun trying to maybe stick some bitters in there this would be really fun we we do a couple different things with it uh, obviously not known as being the most complicated cocktail but this makes an amazing mojito 
because it has that robustness that just the rum stays part of the characteristics of the drink. We uh, occasionally make a rum Rita with this because it oh, has yeah. it has the character to stand up to it. But uh, yeah, it's it's for being so bold, it's quite versatile. Mm -hmm. Yeah, usually when when you encounter a really bold spirit, you, you find that your use cases are potentially limited in the cocktail world, but. To, to me, this is just sort of begging for for a couple things. It's begging for the mint in a in a mojito, and it's, it's really also begging for like that nice curacao, that that orange liqueur that you're going to be using in like a, a margarita type application. I think it could go equally well with both. So, congrats on white rum. White rum's hard. White, white rum is incredibly hard. Yeah. White rum to me was kind of the, the big brand name white rum that ends up at all the weddings and everything. And I knew I wanted to make something that was nothing like it. Next one up, uh, same stuff we just tried, but this particular batch spent 28 months in a used bourbon barrel. In this case, this is one of the products that I, that I have sugared a little bit. It works out to be a little less than half a teaspoon per bottle. What you're really going to find about this one is is it's 116 proof. Uh, the reason I chose 116 was I thought it just really showed itself off. It we gave the most complexity, gave the biggest notes. You'll get a little vanilla, you get a little caramel. I pull a crap ton of honey out of this. Mm -hmm. I, uh, in fact, there's <laughs> there's a video of me sampling this bottle. It was it was the end of last summer, and it was incredibly hot back in the distillery. I'm shirtless, sampling my way through bought barrels of rum and I said this and this is this particular batch I think we have a case left so it's time going to be time to select my next barrel and and dump it but this drinks a lot like a whiskey yeah and and 116 58 percent alcohol by volume that is you know that's that's solidly approaching not it's not quite navy strength right but it's is it approaching navy I guess technically it would be navy I believe navy is 114 114 okay so we're, so, we're right so there it's in the navy um yeah, you know what I don't get on the nose is I don't get like the hotness that you might associate. No, th these these pores have been able to to breathe, um, correct. So so there's that. It's not coming straight out of the bottle. But even if it was straight out of the bottle, I would tell you this is going to be the smoothest 116 that you've ever had. You're going to have some alcohol heat, but there's so much flavor it makes it a very one smooth 116. If this is a little hot for an individual, a single ice cube goes a long way towards tempering some of that heat, but not removing the complexity that's in here. Yeah, you're right about that honey. <laughs> it, it's a it's a honey bomb. It's everywhere. Which coats, is, coats your mouth everywhere. Yeah, and it's strange. Like that, that's not typical. And so, is this the same 100% molasses? Uh, it's 100% molasses. It's mostly blackstrap, and it has a little bit of baking molasses, which is a little bit sweeter. And it's a, just a first fill ex bourbon barrel. It's from former bourbon barrel. Uh, this particular barrel formerly had ten year old bourbon in it. Um, in fact, specifically, the barrel was uh, from Smooth Ambler in Maxwellton, West Virginia, which is where I did a short apprenticeship at. And this barrel also came from them the same year that they won some pretty prestigious awards. There you go. So and I tell people this barrel has pedigree. Yeah, and and that's something that people don't always either know or think about when it comes to aged products is that barrel sourcing is so difficult, especially in the hyper competitive marketplace that we have today. It's almost the hardest part of the program at certain points and in certain ways. Obviously, there's there's a lot of difficult things about distilling and creating great spirits, but it's one of those situations where the entire industry, and we, we, we talked about this in the episode that I did um, on Isla Scotch, the entire industry is trying to kind of out deke each other. They're like trying to do like, remember the, the end of the Mighty Ducks where they did like the triple deke? Yep. And that was the, the, the winning goal. Everyone's trying to like get ahead of everyone else. And yet barrel programs are inherently six to 20 years behind what the industry wants to do right now. So there's this weird lag. It's almost like playing a video game with a terrible lag on it and <laughs> trying to win the game, right? Um, so it's incredibly difficult. And, and I imagine like having that connection where you did an apprenticeship there goes a long way. And so I think to me, that's what makes this so special. It's, an, it's a honey bomb, which is a bit atypical of a rum to me, especially at this proof. Yep. And then to hear that story about the barrel sourcing just makes it like really personal uh so i really enjoyed that that is uh being personal and being transparent is uh at the core of what we do it's why i enjoy having a restaurant here because it keeps you with us a little bit longer and you get to know us better and what we do yeah you almost get almost like um 
if, if I had to put a name on it, I would say clover honey because you get a little bit of the field in here, right? I'll, There's a I'll little bit that. of hay, a little bit of that. hay, yep. but fresh cut, not, not dry. Uh, I, I, I love this spirit. This is, this is one of my favorites. Totally. All right, next one up, we're going to shift gears a little bit. Um, we're going to get into some bourbon. Um, we have bourbon when we have bourbon, and we don't have bourbon when we don't have bourbon. Being young, being started up, we still, to this day, fill barrels when we can afford to buy barrels, which means there's sometimes a lag between when they mature and, and everything. So uh, I think I have three cases of this left. This particular batch, speaking of barrel shenanigans, if you will, we, uh, we do have some smaller barrels. So this started off in small barrels. We then married them together into one big barrel and let them rest. So your, your age range is anywhere from 11 months to 20 months in here. This is a high rye bourbon. Um, I love some rye. It's actually the very first thing I planted on those fields when we, when we got them. I, I love rye for its pepperiness, its, its earthiness, the, the overall spiciness. And what makes me completely go head over heels for rye is just the American history associated with it. Our country was founded on rye whiskey. This bourbon is out of balance a little bit. It's going to hit you a little bit more up front and then kind of taper off and finish off. I like big, bold flavors. So this, out of everything I've made so far and put on the shelf, this is my favorite. That This, hands down, is my favorite spirit. You know, and, and another way to um, approach this idea of being out of balance uh, might be to call it uh, something that, that my friend uh, Paul McDonald from Philadelphia, is this incredible mixologist from Philadelphia, um, he, he talks about flavor experiences like this as being nonlinear. Um, I'll take it. And, and I, I think, cause, cause what you're saying is like, you know, you said, oh, this is a bit out of balance, but I really love it. And so I, I, I don't like there, I think there's ways to not be pejorative about it. And especially like one of the things that I noticed when I was nosing this, I was like, I might like, like you get an oakiness here that, that might be due to small barrels, right? And hundred percent. And that is hard to get around when you're trying to get a product with some age and some like this beautiful color on it. I mean, it's got beautiful color for the amount of time that it's been aged. So like, I, I, I don't think, I think that's just a dilemma that any, anyone's going to have to face in your situation. And so I think what this does is it sets a baseline for everything else that follows. Correct. Right. Uh, within that, uh, our barrel program, we've pretty much exclusively shifted over to filling full size and slightly less than full size, which is also a reason that there's going to be a lapse in bourbon here for a little bit. Sure. Um, cause just the larger barrel is going to take a little bit longer. Um, but what I love is yes, there's some extra wood in there, mm -hmm. uh, but it's not that pencil shaving wood that you often get. No, not at all. It's, it's just, it's Oak. And with that high rye, I think they work in concert to make you a really nice mouth feel and a really nice full palate experience front to back. And even on the, even on the, even on the finish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't expect that mouth feel from that nose. The nose is a little rougher than I think the mouth feel ended up being. What What is the mash bill? If you're willing to reveal it, if not, no big deal. Uh, we are on this particular batch. I believe we were sixty thirty five five. So okay. sixty corn, thirty five rye, five percent malted barley. Okay, malted barley. Okay, yeah. And just a regular pale malt, nothing fancy on the malted barley mm -hmm. on, on this particular batch. Yeah. Well, I think that this is, and, and so for, this would be like a two-ish two year bourbon, kind of? I'd call it a slightly over a year, between 11-month-old and 20-month-old. If you want to call it a, a year and a half, yeah. a year and a quarter is, is probably what your average age ends up being. Most bourbons at this young of an age just wouldn't be palatable at all. I right. give I give a lot of the credit to sweet mashing instead of sour mashing. Okay. Just produces a much more palatable spirit to begin with. That that kind of goes back to the corn whiskey. Um, being kind of, despite being young and having some of that fire, being quite palatable. I think having starting with something so palatable and putting it into good wood, we, we, we use... We use a couple different sources for wood for some different specific reasons. Um, I honestly think a bourbon this young has, has has no right to sip this well and drink this well, and yet here we are. It does. I agree with you, and this this is really interesting because uh, so I did some judging in January at the American Distilling Institute's annual judging of craft spirits, and I had an interaction there. It wasn't it wasn't a personal interaction, but it was an observed interaction that really irritated me. It was during the opening remarks where the president was kind of explaining to folks that there was going to be a lot of different categories and there was going to be, 
based on the rise of craft distilling, some, some categories that were rather young. And so there was going to be some two-year-old straight bourbon whiskeys that were being judged. And, and it was important to judge these as two-year-old straight bourbon whiskeys, not as a straight bourbon whiskey that has spent eight years in a barrel. And, you know, so in that respect, needs more time on wood is just not a really useful or accurate criticism of that. You got to kind of meet it where it's at. And, you know, some guy was, who has just been doing this for a long time was just like, but what if it just does need more time on wood? And it's like, ah, oh, man. And, and what tasting this, like right now, validates in me is that like, no, there, there are young whiskeys that can really be approachable in, you know, just a situation where you wouldn't expect them to be approachable at all. Because, you know, when I, like this, this tastes like a three plus, three to four to me. And especially having come out of small barrels, small barrels kind of betray that pretty quickly. And this, the palate, is just a real achievement for, for that amount of time in a barrel. So, so very cool. Thank you. Um, maybe I should have brought another one out. I have a, my, my batch two bourbon is a single barrel, but 35 gallon. And it actually, um, it's got a little bit more alcohol than this, but uh, you, you lose that extra oak and it's, it's, it may be even a better example than this of a, of a of a future release and what's up and coming, but I prefer this non-linear forward flavor, bigger notes that are that are in this for my personal palate. Yeah, and it's it's a really cool reacquaintance with oak for me because a lot of people are are going away from that strong tannic profile, and you know, strong tannic profile. You could you could say it pejoratively. You'd be like, ah, it's it tastes like tea, it's drying my mouth out. But like sometimes it's just nice to be reminded that, hey, this is what oak does. Correct. You know? Correct. It's, uh, yeah, that, I, I don't even know what to add to that. I, I, I agree 100%. I, it's non-oak Chardonnay versus oak Chardonnay. Yep. And, and sometimes, you know, typically I would prefer a non-oaked, but sometimes if they hit that oak just right in the oak Chardonnay, like give me that all day over the non-oaked. Yep. Yeah. And, and especially for like an, a quasi educational initiative that you have by trying to like take this conservative area and, and little by little expand their, their, fl their flavor, I guess, adventurousness. Mm -hmm. uh, that's like a cool, like part of that curriculum, right? If you, if you look at education as a curriculum, it's like, okay, uh, this week is Oak week and we're going to talk about Oak and here's a couple ways to look at that. And I think that's super valuable, especially when people don't know that they're being educated. They, they just think they're being pleasured. Correct. And that's, <laughs> I, again, that lead, that's why the sit-down experience lends itself so well to what we do and having such a wide offering. What you are getting into right now is our spiced rum. Starts mm -hmm. out as a clear rum. We steep a bunch of herbs and botanicals in it, just like making a tea. Strain them back out. We do sugar this again just a little bit. And really what we're going after, some of those herbs had some of those high tannin notes. So we just want to temper the end of them. We're working with less than a teaspoon less than half a teaspoon of sugar per bottle. Yep. Uh, big notes you're gonna pull here is gonna be cinnamon, clove, star anise, nutmeg. There are some more flavors in there, but they're kind of supporting and, and binding and helping that be a very, so in this case, I think all of those different spices are quite linear and blend into each other quite well. Yeah, because well. I was almost gonna say allspice, but it, it's not, it's the nutmeg interacting with the star anise that's giving me that allspicy set out to create a spice rum that was nothing like the major players in spice rum. I wanted an entirely different palate experience and I wanted something that I could personally sip on straight and enjoy. You got strong baking flavors, um, excellent fall flavors, though it still works year round beautifully. Totally. And, and uh, I love the three dimensional experience of, of nosing this because I'm like wafting this around my, my nose right now which is geographically difficult because I have a massive nose. Um, it's, a shared, it's, it's a shared problem. <laughs> hey, it's an asset, right? <laughs> it, it definitely is an asset. In our industry. But yeah, I get a very three-dimensional olfactory experience with this. So what I really love about these glasses, they're Glen Karn in style, but they're not. Um, yeah, because if you called it Glen Cairn, you would, I think a SWAT team would drop correct, from the correct. ceiling and, and uh, serve you papers. This is just a, a whiskey nosing glass. It has the bulbous base, it tapers in, but you know, go low on it, go high on it, kind of get in the middle and watch just from high, low pulling off on that glass, how much it, it, it can and will change. You know, you know what I like about this? And, and this, 
pertains to sweetness. This type of demographic that we're talking about, a more conservative type of, of drinker, uh, perhaps a, a demographic that's maybe 10 years older than a, a more urban demographic would be, uh, just based on like where people tend to settle, right? I, I think that palate tends to be a little bit sweeter, right? They are the port drinkers. They are, you know, the people who, who get the, like the Tennessee honey, for example, as opposed to a non-sweetened bottle. And, you know, the way you're describing this, this sweetness as being less than half a teaspoon or around a half a teaspoon per bottle of, of sugar or of whatever sweetener you're using, you know, it's super dry. And you get the sweetness, maybe not more on the aroma, but you get the sweetness just as much on the aroma. Uh, and it really doesn't, like, give you that kind of kind of like sticky in your mouth after you swallow i'm 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 huge on flavor and flavor for me begins before it ever even goes in your mouth it's the nose it's the it's it's flavor in every corner of your mouth but i'm also huge on mouthfeel yeah um so that syrupy lip smacking residual will be found in none of my spirits ever right and this is this it, and this does have a different mouthfeel than the unsweetened but it's so weird to me like think it like People at home, think about this. Adding sugar to stuff makes it taste sweet, and taste is not a flavor, taste is a taste. Sugar, sweetness, is a taste buds thing. What I'm telling you right now is what I'm getting out of this particular experience is I'm smelling that sweetness, which is a little bit of synesthesia on my part. You probably can't smell granulated sugar, right? And then I'm getting it as a mouth feel, and I think that's so remarkable that it's it's really like I'm the, the the spice profile is what I'm tasting in terms of flavor, and I, again just just a really great achievement, and especially as an educational case study where you're trying to get people to come in and try new stuff, um, because it tricks them like the aroma is going to trick them into thinking it's sweet, and then by the time they take a sip, they're going to be so focused on the really nice, well integrated botanical well, I call it botanical the spice profile of this spice rum that they're going to forget about the fact that they were looking for actual sugar sweetness and they're just going to focus on that nice profile and the mouthfeel. I, I, yeah, when you say it that way, it sounds like I'm trying to lure them in with some nose sweetness so they can actually experience flavor. And I never once thought about it that way, and, but maybe that's exactly what I'm trying to do. It, yeah, it's in, oh, man, that's so cool. Very, very cool. Thank you. Last one up that I poured uh, for us to try is our gin. Commissioned my gin still a little over a year ago. It arrived, had to wait for a pipe fitter to get some time to come fit it in. So I've only been working with this gin still for a little over a month. Ran a couple different gin recipes. We started these gin recipes by just a maceration at first to kind of get an idea of everything working together and how, how it works out. And what I knew I wanted to do from day one is not a London dry. Um, <laughs> quite honestly, had a bad experience as a child with uh, as a younger version of me with a London Dry and just can't disassociate that. And uh, I, I always equate a London Dry to a Christmas tree punching in the mouth over and over again. So I wanted to steer clear of that. I wanted to go New World and um, within New World, citrus made a lot of sense to me. So not a, not a gin botanical bill, which I will not share, but not a gin botanical bill where we're going to say, oh, there's 74 or 50... It, it, we're, we're staying underneath a dozen and a half different botanicals, but we're essentially, we're upping the citrus, specifically the lemon, and we're upping the pepper a little bit. Mm -hmm. Wanted to make a gin that I could enjoy and also that could be sipped straight. And honestly, a gin that I could enjoy before I started out doing this was, was kind of a, a, a tall order mm -hmm. um, because I, I categorically do not like gin, but within the gin world, I have found a few that, that I can not just tolerate but enjoy and um this is definitely one that i can enjoy yeah are there are there uh, are you willing to share those because like i you know i try not to talk down about uh brands but if, if they're brands that, that kind of got you to like get into gin then that's um, maybe useful for our listeners right so within brands that got me to get into gin um who were they um, honestly, uh, Wiggle Whiskey makes a Geneva mm -hmm. that I really enjoy, and we'll make a, our own Geneva here at some point as well, because I, Geneva is probably what got me to be able to not just tolerate, but enjoy gin. Right. Um, that grain forward build. Correct. Uh, there is definitely a bottle of, uh, let me see if I, hopefully I don't butcher the name, but Monkey 47. 
that which is a hyper premium like uh, I believe it's made in Germany. Yep. And then uh, you know the very first one ever hit me before I even really thought that this is what I was going to do with my life. Um, Hendrix. Mm -hmm. um, you know uh, the cucumber, and if yep. you give it a little cucumber in the cocktail, a little salt and pepper, it comes out phenomenal. And that's I phenomenal is what I was going for here. And I for me personally in my palate, I, I we achieved it. Yeah, uh, Hendrix definitely changed the face of gin about 15 years ago. Uh, that's that's for sure. They just actually released Hendrix Orbium, which is okay. uh, a really really cool new take that they had. They, they added a little bit more florals in with their regular bill. I, and within that, and within the spirits world, like it, that's great when a big brand kind of paves the way for me to be able to put out unique flavors because if you expect spirit a to taste like spirit a with only a half degree deviation either way it makes it real hard for me to come in and, and throw my things at you but the fact that consumers palates you know craft brewing has done a ton right. for people being willing to taste new things in a different way yeah so the hendrix funky 47 and uh Wiggle whiskey geneva are, yeah. are, are probably the, the three that i can name off the top of my head that i that I can and would sit down and drink at any point in time. You know, there's a softness and a fruitiness to this that reminds me a little bit of a Plymouth style gin. And and, okay. and many people think of Plymouth as a brand because right, there's that bottle of Plymouth gin. And that's another really approachable bottle of gin, uh, especially if you're trying to get into cocktails. It's really soft. It is very different than the London dry style, even though it is made in England. And this reminds me of a Plymouth style a little bit. I'm getting, what is what is the uh, the base of this? So the base is my vodka, but not activated carbon filtered. So you get a lot of that wheat sweetness coming through, which okay. is which I think helps to temper some of the botanicals, particularly the juniper. The you know London Dry juniper for it's incredibly juniper forward. There's obviously a lot of juniper in here, um, but uh, a little bit of the sweetness from the base spirit coming through helps to just not just temper it, but make it a a a more layered mm -hmm. palate experience as opposed to being kind of one or maybe two dimensional. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you definitely get the lemon. The lemon peel's really nice. And uh, I think you know, that that was the missing piece of the puzzle for me was to know that it was like the weeded, the weeded gin. Mm -hmm. Because now I like I did probably half a day of, of gin judging at ADI. And like that was a category it was weeded gin. Now this now this is starting to click in with some of those marks that I tasted on that day. So uh, again, I think a really accessible product for for people coming off the streets who have that same association as you do because as anyone in the industry will tell you the christmas tree argument is the most prevalent reason why people are, can't get into gin and consistent with going back to the food menu and and even this time just kind of going even directly for me very approachable mm -hmm. uh it has some depth so even an amateur gin drinker can step in and really enjoy this i'm not committed to this being the only gin we make we'll make a geneva we probably at some point will do our own take on a London Dry. We'll probably have that juniper bomb, but we'll throw just enough of something else in that it mm -hmm. that it doesn't become flat. It doesn't become linear. I am personally surprised with myself at how much I am enjoying making gin, given my past relationship and thoughts towards the the, the category as a whole. Right, right. And I think again, like, what do you think of when you think of gin? You think of botanicals. Yep. With this. I get agriculturals plus botanicals. And I think that, like you were talking about, like I wanted to make a gin that, gin that I could sip. And especially the fact that you're beginning to build out your barrel program more and more, you know, like, you know, you, you could go towards the barrel aged eventually. Uh, if you, you know, All, it, already, already filled uh, up some barrels. There we go. <laughs> See, getting ahead of myself. Uh, well, Yanni, thanks for taking me through these marks. Um, I want to hit some uh, lightning round questions, but first, can I just talk to you really quickly about some of the cocktails that you're doing and some of the cocktail applications that you're really excited about? People just heard us taste through these, kind of um, go through the flavor profiles. Um, what are the cocktails, like? I guess, right now, or maybe there's like your favorite cocktail of all time that, that was developed for your program? Like, How are you using these with other ingredients successfully? So out in the world of the internet, there is definitely a video of me doing a how to make my own favorite cocktail, and it's a glass of bourbon. Um, but we'll, we'll leave that to the side. Um, <laughs> The my favorite cocktail that uh, that we have and 
I'm always willing to try new things. So to nail down a favorite in, in, in the world, in the entire universe, um, I'm probably just going to steer clear of it. But my favorite cocktail we have is our Old Fashioned Number 1. We actually created an Old Fashioned Number 2 with the corn whiskey, and I, I, I kept Old Fashioned Number 1 as, a, as an empty category. Just that cocktail didn't exist until the bourbon came out. Uh, it is just a, a touch of simple syrup and three dashes of walnut bitters. It is mm. incredibly simple, but it's it's I like booze forward drinks, period. And we make it with our bourbon batch three, which has a little extra rye in it. So it's got that pepperiness, that spiciness, a little bit of simple syrup. Just it, it doesn't make it sweet, but it makes it less dry, which kind of mm. works. Uh, it works to reduce some of those that that mouth felt perception of those tannins mm -hmm. from the from, extra from the small barrels and the walnut bitters too. And then the walnut bitters just come in and and, and crush it. Yeah. So that is that is my favorite cocktail on the menu. That uh, an old fashioned is a, a well made old fashioned can can really tickle my fancy. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of poorly made old fashions out there. I heard there was like some some jalapeno infused something recently that that I was hearing about. Yeah, so that's going to be our, I believe that's our corn whiskey with a uh, jalapeno honey water. And I forget what else we worked into that. Um, that's an incredibly popular cocktail, despite jalapeno being in the name. Like, we got enough people to finally try, and they're like, this is, this is, this is really good. My favorite cocktail, and you're going to, I'm going to lean on you for this. Universally, what I always try if it's on the menu anywhere is, I'm not going to have to lean on you, I just remembered, Sazerac. Mm -hmm. I love a Sazerac. And I've had a lot of different versions of Sazerac. We actually have a Sazerac on the menu right now. It's made with the aged rum. Um, oh, so, be yes. so between yes, yes. between the Sazerac and our old fashioned number one, that is totally a uh, how I'm feeling that day, uh, how my palate is feeling that day, uh, which one would have to be my favorite cocktail between the two. Okay, and you know what the cool thing is, because you have such a breadth of spirits between aged, unaged, uh, American style versus you've got these rums going on and some some gins that are you know a little bit categorically difficult to pin down sometimes i think that you have the option to you know really start incorporating some you know some cool like more tropical you know themes as we're starting to get a little bit warmer here uh we've had uh, yes we will uh we've also had uh an incredible amount of discussions of it revolving around our cocktail menu right now i, I think we offer too many um so Fair. we're actually going to dr in steps drastically pare it down uh, and then what we'll do is we'll start to have a, a more seasonal section, a lot like our food specials are, right. where we'll hit those tropical. Um, Uzo is going to hit the shelf relatively soon, nice. and we're going to juice some watermelons, and we're going to put Uzo in with it. And depending on how we're feeling that day, we're either going to put some basil or some mint. It's an incredibly simple cocktail, but uh, incredibly summery. Our painkiller, a painkiller made with that white rum. Mm. <clears throat> Correct. One, one of Correct. The, one of the one of the true <laughs> pleasures of being alive is yep. a is a, is a painkiller. Good lord, yes. Yeah, and and that white rum has that funk and it has that backbone that it's it just it it makes a, a phenomenal painkiller. I mean, pineapple, orange, and cream of coconut are big big flavor so you need something with that spine it, it, it correct it's that it's that spine it's the character it's the robustness and it and it makes that cocktail amazing um so yeah we'll get some more summary on uh we uh we generally year-round keep a rum punch on and uh rum punch was another one of my like unobtainable muses for a while like we kept making batches and they were they were good, but we couldn't quite get them to great. And finally, we made some falernum in house uh, and added it. And it it added that velvety yep. creaminess on the mouthfeel, that little bit of clove spiciness. Still, for me, that's a that's a one, maybe two drink because it is or that specific one we have on now is a little sweeter than yep. my palate calls for. But if you want to go summary, yeah, the the rum punch, the uh, <laughs> the uh, the painkiller. Uh, that's not a drink I regularly order, but I definitely sample it. And I, honestly, the mojito, the mojito with that white rum has the right amount of crispness. It has the right amount of rum strength to it. Um, yeah, those are all solid options. We make a lavender lemonade mm -hmm. with, a, with the vodka, and it's fresh squeezed lemon juice and a lavender simple syrup. It's crazy simple. That cocktail never leaves my menu. We sell a ton of it. We're, in fact, going to be bottling it soon so people can just come in and take it home with them. Um, a great summer cocktail. Um, yeah, there's you're, there's always something for just about any mood you have and just about any 
feeling you want to have on our menu. Well, and you're right in saying that, like, really, what the struggle is with with a program as diverse as yours is is narrowing it down. Yeah, and we're I, we're going to. I'm I'm full hardly committed to it. We uh, we've been incredibly busy so far this year, and we're not even into Gettysburg busy season. Correct. So we have to pare it down in order to be able to execute when we get even busier than we are now. Yes, yes. Well, best of luck on the cocktail program. Uh, are we ready for some lightning round? Yeah, let's go lightning round. Cool. So we already hit upon this, I think. You said Sazerac. Uh, but is, is the Sazerac indeed your favorite cocktail? If so, what do you, what do you like? Like, what's your ideal Sazerac situa- situation, I guess? Um, ideal Sazerac situation, uh, something with enough rye spicy. So one of my, <laughs> it's not my own cocktail. One of my favorite, one of the, my first experiences with Sazeracs that made me fall in love with Sazeracs I had out in Seattle and there was just a hint of lavender to it. Just the fact that it had just that slightly extra, an extra layer to it. Um, generally I'm not a huge on, on lavender. I prefer bolder, spicier, savior, more savory. Um, yeah, it, favorite cocktail. Sazerac is going to be the favorite cocktail, but I would probably personally try to cheat that question and just say a really well-made whiskey straight. And also give me a glass of tepid room temperature water and an eyedropper so I can play with it, preferably an overproof to start with, so I can walk it through its paces at different proofs and see if I can find something even more, a note more beautiful than what they bottled it at. Yeah, and that kind of is like creating a cocktail in if you, if you identify a clo- cocktail as a, a flavor profile that is curated, right? So if you get that water and you can curate that flavor profile for yourself and kind of, you know, make it kind of do its dance for you, yes. then I, I totally buy that. I mean, you're going to have people being like, that's not a cocktail, you know, spirit sugar bitters. But I, I, I like that answer, and I, I don't think that's really cheating. I've... I've, uh, <laughs> I've uh, become quite comfortable with the I'll, I'll 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 stand by what i say and if somebody wants to give me guff about it so yeah a something a, a whiskey and within that at i'll any class like i my 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 favorites are a good rye whiskey or a good it i lay islay single malt scotch I, I love the smoke those will be my two favorite but uh i also really really like bourbon mm. i sometimes can get in an irish whiskey mood um I can go non Isla scotches. Um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, even uh, we have a we have a corn whiskey that I aged in a used bourbon barrel, and then I finished in a cognac barrel. Oh. It is not as it is nowhere. It it's it it, it knows is sweeter, tastes a little bit drier, kind of mm-hmm. similar almost to that that spiced rum we tried, but it doesn't have peppery notes, which is typical of something I really enjoy. But um, give it to me overproof. Let me let me let me get, take it on a walk and see what flavors I can pull out of it. That is, hands down, my favorite cocktail. We live in a beautiful world full of beautiful whiskey, so uh, yeah, no <laughs> yeah. fault. No, there's no faulting you on that. Uh, so if you were a cocktail ingredient, what would you be? Yeah, so thought about that one a little bit, and uh, I'm going to give maybe an atypical answer. I'm going to exclude myself from any actual physically tangible ingredient and go back to all of the ingredients that are non-tangible. Farming the land, the, the, the actual grain before it ever ends up in the whiskey, all, all, of, uh, all of those things. And if you make me stick to one, I'm going to go to the land. Um, I grew up doing a lot of different things, working a lot of different jobs. But one of my favorite things I did was uh, I worked on a horse farm growing up. And so we didn't really do so much row crop as we did hay. Um, but just the experience and the connection that you have to the land, which is also why, you know, you pulled out some grassy notes, you pulled out some earthy notes, not by accident. Um, that, that just, that really relates to me and it is, it is comfort to me. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's the hard work. It's the invisible things to the end consumer that have to go in to making this product that you never get to see and you never really get to appreciate it's it's the behind the scenes mm-hmm. stuff so so the land and if i can expand upon it the farming that you do to the land it's the the land like it's the it's the it's a connection back to it's a connection back to everything yeah that's a very like zen answer and you're talking about terroir right like and and the cool thing about terroir is that it doesn't stop at like you know 
how much it rained that year or it doesn't stop at like whether you're on a limestone cliff or a, a, a clay valley but but what it is is it, it's it's an interaction with the human practices and the human decisions right you you said i am the reason like the the reason why these decisions were made it's it's a terroir uh, i also go back to i remember our f- very first year we started farming before we ever had our physical location nailed down and uh we had rye planted and a a hailstorm came through and i (laughs) before the storm even ended i i I drove out i'm like i got it i was worried like if it's all laying over flat dead we're gone and i'm driving out fields are laying flat everywhere i'm like oh god i'm gonna get there and we just not even open no source of revenue and we've put thousands of dollars into this field and uh It could not be more picture perfect as I rolled up to the field, like it was literally the single ray of sunshine coming down. And it it was these beautiful green, slightly purple rye heads just standing strong and high and just (laughs) saying fuck you to everything that was thrown at it, that I am here. I will not go silently into that night. I will, it was, uh, it was so visceral and real that that's you know that's not an experience you get when you when you pour the bottle that's an experience that uh, unfortunately is is probably reserved for me and just my uh, in the intimacy that I share in the whole production process but I loved what I was doing uh, before that moment ever came but that's when I just I I I mean that's when I I fell even deeper in love I was just also at the time like incredibly trying trying to build out the place trying to make sure you know father son owned and operated like no no huge investor going well you need a new thing here's a check um so it it uh, maybe i personified the grain and that year's rye crop more than it even wanted to be but it, it 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 worked for me so that's why i go back to the land and the growing experience it's that's that's the cocktail ingredient i choose to be mm-hmm. Well, and even the impulse to distill is, uh, you know, they say that the primary characteristic that you get out of a, a ferment and then a distillate is the character of what went into it. That is the primary flavor. And d- distillation is an act of focusing. And so even if the people who enjoy your spirits weren't there with you when you rolled up on that field and had this incredibly, like, terrifying and, and also validating and cathartic moment with the agricultural product that you were about to rely on for your livelihood, you took that, you distilled it, you focused those flavors. And so you're still communicating that to people. They, they maybe won't be there. They weren't there to see it, but you're focusing it and you're, you're kind of infusing all the stuff that comes off that still with it. So there, there's something about great spirits and great cocktails. That's, that's very like, very much like poetry. Uh, it's, it's about taking something that's in your head or something that you touched or that you knew and translating that so you can stick it in somebody else's brain somehow and have it mean something to them that is similar to what it means to you. And it's that shared vibration that you're creating. So I think that that, that story is incredible. I think it can yeah. like that, that type of storytelling can only be found like here, Yep. you know? Um, so that, that's really beautiful. If you could have a cocktail with anybody past or present, who would it be? George Washington. George Washington? Yeah. Why? Founding father uh, made incredibly large amounts of money because he produced so much rye whiskey. So uh, second generation born here, but could not be more proud to be an American. Wouldn't want to ever live or be raised anywhere else. Uh, and to have the opportunity to uh, to sit down with somebody who helped carve it out and forge it for all of us it the united states and and it's 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 imperfectness but it's beautiful intricacies and 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 the place that gave my family like my grandparents came over on boats learned to speak english when they're here naturalized just the fact that uh, it can be narrowed down to a handful of men that helped carve that out and create that is something that uh it, it's, it elicits a deep emotional response for me. Mm-hmm. And then the fact that the guy made a crap ton of rye whiskey, like, we're going to get along just fine. Yeah, I hope to personally make it up to Mount Vernon where he they, they've done a good good job trying to kind of revive some old recipes and stuff like that. So I'm hoping that we can get the podcast out there in the near future. So Very hopefully cool. we'll be learning a lot more about George Washington and his rye distillation. So getting into advice now, 
Were there any books that were influential to you when you uh, started uh, experimenting with either the agricultural side of this or the distilling or the cocktails? Any, any books that really stand out in your memory? Read a ton of different books, and uh, my own experiences led me to go with uh, go what I think I need to do, and if what I think I need to do doesn't work, double down on what I thought I needed to do. Um, I'm speaking specifically to that rum experience. Yep. Um, read a lot of them, and there's a lot of good information, and there's a lot of good history in there, but no, I, I'm not going to call out a single book that really, that really guided me. I, mm -hmm. I, I think more just having the spirit of, um, I don't know. I, maybe this is giving myself too much credit, but just uh, going a little bit outlaw, like mm -hmm. literally just ignoring what everybody else is telling you to do and do it your own way. Yep. And I think like when you're trying to get something like this off the ground, I, I think it would be a little bit maybe foolhardy to, to expect one text to give you the answer because what we've found in craft distilling is that there is no one answer. You got to invent the answer to a, to a certain degree, and the rest of it is just kind of dealing with that bureaucratic stuff and <laughs> again, trying, to, trying to persist. So the bureaucratic stuff remains and always will remain my least favorite part, but it is a, it's a price I'm willing to pay in order to be able to do what I love to do. But yeah, just experimentation. Have have an idea in your head and and have an idea how you're going to influence that mash bill and how you're going to distill it, and then try it. And then when it doesn't come out the way you thought it was going to come out, think about why, mm -hmm. and then. Uh, go back and manipulate that process a little bit more and tweak it until you end up where you want to end up. If you pay attention, you, you, you track what you do, then you can very much tr retrace your steps and, and, yeah. and attribute certain things to certain decisions. Correct. And others may, you know, immediately call it a book or two, but I consider what I do to be based in science, but final execution lies in, lies in art. And that art is that experimentation and that trial. And, and I think if you stick too much to the science, you end up making things that pour like science like rigid firm they don't they don't end up to be that 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 whole experience that you really want to have mm -hmm. I, I look at it and i equate it to like if you follow the german purity laws for making beer you end up with like a solid beer um but if you decide to like harvest your the naturally living um anything in your beard if you focus on the bacteria the yeast and you cultivate that and put it in all of a sudden you and i forget the gentleman's name and which brewery he was for but when you do the weird stuff you find or the when you not even weird if you just do things that others aren't doing you're either going to find out that there's definitely a reason that nobody does it that way sure yep or you're going to find out that oh, holy shit there's this whole new level of taste and, and mouthfeel that just exists that not many, if anybody's playing with it because they want to stay within the lines. Uh -huh. You're either going to find where something is or you're going to find where something's not. If the amount of things I've done that in the back room, in my production room, that will never see the light of day because I learned a lot of different ways to not do something would make a person cry. But the amount of things that come out from that experimentation like it will, it will, will also make you cry, but for an entirely different reason. Mm -hmm. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Before we sign off here and before we tell folks where they can find you, where they can find you on social media, do you have any final words of advice or requests for our listeners uh, or for the folks here that you're serving locally? If, you, if and when you come see me, come visit my distillery. Ask for me. If you hear this, ask for me. If you have a question, ask for me. If you just want to meet me, do it. Uh, my staff here is, uh, is very personal mm -hmm. they give a piece of themselves to every time you come in and that's because it starts at the top down i give my a piece of myself to everybody that comes in and if you want to make the connection um ask for me i'm 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 here quite a bit i'm not quite here all the time we sometimes do some off-site events and every now and then i'd, I'd like to go home um but <laughs> but i'm I, I'm here pretty often, and if there's a if there's a connection you want to make, um, if there's a criticism you want to give, or a compliment you want to give, or if you just want to be like, hey, I want to meet the guy that I heard or meet the guy that I saw, just ask for me. I've I've noticed in doing this, I've something you know we learn more about ourselves the the just the more life we experience, and I pretty early on in this whole car accident catalyst adventure um learned that there's two parts of me uh i love creating and you know there's that side of me that you know creatives tend to be like recluses leave me alone leave me in my space let me do my thing uh, but i also found out there's this other part of me of uh that really 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 feels complete when i get to make the thing but i also get to see the people enjoy the thing i'm making so 
if talk to me, you want to come in and be like, Hey, I love your rum. You want to come in and tell me you hate my rum. Fine. I'll have that conversation too. Um, preferably you love it. Like I think like, I'm pretty proud of it. Um, <laughs> and if you tell me you hate it, I'm going to ask you why. And I'm going to put you on the spot. I'm going to make you say like, well, I didn't like this note. I didn't like that note. And then I'm going to steer you to another one of my spirits. I'm going to find something that, uh, that you love because there is enough breadth in what we're offering that, uh, I got something for just about everybody. For sure. And I personally do love the rum. Uh, <laughs> so I, I hope that other folks come in here and, and love it as well. But how can folks find you on social media, on the internet? And um, if you just want to give like a quick address and like the general hours when the public can enter the space and eat and drink. For sure. Uh, hours of operation close Monday, Tuesday, open for lunch and dinner Wednesday through Saturday. And then Sunday, we only open for brunch. It's 11 to 3 best ways to get a hold of us you can call in 717-398-3385 yeah that's right facebook instagram are going to be the two main social media outlets if you really like what we're doing go to our website which is is not bad i gotta update some more things but it's a it's a pretty well done website but there's always more to add to it join my email list i don't send a lot out when i do they're very worth reading we generally maintain an open rate of almost 50 percent which in 2019 is pretty ridiculous yep that's unheard of yeah so i don't send a ton out i will not inundate anybody with a ton of emails but uh typically those emails have a little bit of new release information mm -hmm. a general update around here and uh i started doing something about a year ago where i just close it out with uh a message from me um sometimes it's a uh, just a heartfelt thank you because without people coming in i don't and buying things i don't get to do this uh, sometimes this past one I announced our gin and then I got into just giving some future updates and then uh, I, I announced my engagement to people I literally this week had two people come in just to tell me congratulations on my engagement there you um, go. which was <laughs> I, I you know this is we're not we're not a big international brand we're a small family-owned brand if I have something to offer that nobody else does it's uh, it's hospitality, it's personality, and it's it's transparency and it's authenticity. Um, it, you know, it's if you boil it down to, well, he's just making liquor. That's not you know, like that seems kind of lofty. Um, I would disagree because uh, this has become something that is almost the entirety of my life, and I and I choose to share it with everybody. Mm -hmm. So you get a real genuine experience when you come here. Couldn't agree more so far. Having been here just for a short amount of time, I, I couldn't agree more. So, uh, Yanni, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Absolutely. Complete and total pleasure. Thank you for uh, thank you for making the connection and coming out and spending some time and uh, getting to talk and uh, try some of my wares and see what I have to offer. Amen. Anytime, brother. Cheers. Cheers. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, there's two big things you can do for us here at Modern Bar Cart. One would be to tell your friends and family if you think they'd enjoy listening to us talk about cocktails. And if they don't download podcasts, they can always stream our episodes on their desktop directly from the show notes page at modernbarcart.com. The other thing you can do to help would be to head on over to iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts and leave us a review. Five stars are great, but we're more interested in your feedback. And the beauty is, the more reviews we have, the easier it will be for other folks out there to learn about our show. We're trying to start a cocktail revolution here, and by spreading the word, you're helping us fight the good fight. You can always reach us by emailing podcast at modernbarcart.com if you're looking for cocktail or bartending advice, or if you're a pro who would like to pull up a mic and be interviewed for all to hear. Also, definitely follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Modern Bar Cart for cocktail porn, recipes, and entertaining tips. And keep an eye out for new product releases and special offers, which are happening all the time. We love our listeners, and we really enjoy giving you exclusive discounts and sneak peeks at our latest and greatest cocktail projects. This episode may be over, but for you, the mixological fun and adventures are just beginning. So remember, folks, drink responsibly and experiment boldly. This episode was made possible with editing and production assistance by Samantha Reed, Distilling Insights and Battlefield to Glass Spirits by Yanni Barakas, 
video content by Cameo Media and a little bit of interview magic by yours truly. This has been a Modern Bar Cart production, copyright 2019.